So um, I'm a geriatrician, which is a doctor which, um, uh, who specialises in the complexities of treating older people. And today I'd like to share with you some recent research um, which might show you how to master time and put me out of a job. Um, so um, what will I be like when I'm old? Well, that's a very personal question, and it brings in all these um, issues we've been thinking about today, including what might happen to our identity as we get older. Well, the fact is that older people are really very varied. They're much more varied than younger people in almost every way we can measure them. I mean, take these two people, for example. This man, he's just had his bath in the English Channel, and his skin is nicely tanned, showing that he's got regular exposure to the vitamin D from the sun. He's got well-preserved muscles, which contrast him to this lady, who doesn't even have the muscle strength to get into the bath on her own. But more than that, she actually lacks the cognitive ability, the mental ability, to even plan the task of washing herself. So what makes the difference between these two older adults of the same age? Well, for a start, they're of different sex, um, and they're also of different genes, of course. And you might think that your ageing is all about your genes, all about your inheritance. But you'd be wrong. Only 25% of longevity is inherited. This means that 75% of the differences in lifespan between people, between all of us here, is not due to genes, but due to other factors, factors which might be modifiable. So as you know, um, we've been studying identical twins, and we've been studying ageing and identical twins, and they're an excellent model for looking at the modifiable factors which might lead to differential ageing. And this is because, um, in reference to a previous speaker, we're removing some of the lenses um, to look at the subject. Um, they've come from the same background, they've got the same, um, they've got the same era, they've grown up in the same cohort, and of course they've got the same identical DNA code. Now today I'd like to focus on cognitive ageing, the ageing of your mental functions. Um, and this is actually the most important aspect of ageing for most people. And as a clinician, I know firsthand the devastating effects of dementia. But I'd also like to impress on you the importance of staying sharp for absolutely everybody. Take this woman, for example. Now she's actually a carer for her husband who's got um, Parkinson's disease and he's behind her. And recently, she's had to learn his really complex medication regime to give him. And she also has to manage the logistics of getting him to all his hospital appointments and physiotherapy, etc. Now, she never learned to drive when she was younger. And so, because he can no longer do the shopping, she's now had to learn how to get to grips with the internet to get her shopping over the internet. And also, for the first time now, she's dealing with the family finances. So, she's learning all these new things but she's doing it with very little help from outside because her children live hundreds of miles away and her friends, many of whom have died or have problems of their own. So the question for you is, how can you ensure that when you're hurt rage, you've got all your marbles to throw back at whatever life throws you? So we studied um, twins to try and answer this question. So we studied identical twins in 1999 and in 2000 with the same battery of cognitive tests. And we looked at the difference, the change in their tests performance over the 10 years. And back at the beginning of the study, we asked them all manner of questions about their lifestyle and also comprehensively tested their physical functioning. Now, what do you think would be the most important factors back in 1999, which might predict which of these twins, and in fact, this, this is um, the same twin pair, um, which of these twins would have go on, gone on to have better maintained their cognitive function? Well, we expected and found um, that vascular risk factors, such as blood pressure and levels of cholesterol, were important. And we expected that education, occupation, and the level of mental, you know, mental uh, work that they were doing would be protective, but the twins were so similar in this regard, we couldn't find a difference. But none of these factors, and actually also diet as well, those factors put into a big model to test all these lenses together, those factors were not the most important. The most significant factor influencing which twin would have gone on to have better maintained their mental functioning was the strength of their legs back in 1999. And the strength of their legs was itself associated with the level of physical activity. 
Put it a different way, the twin who had stronger legs had better maintained her function over the 10 years. And we went on to look at um, the um, brain changes, the brain imaging changes in twins who had different leg strength at the beginning of the study. And the twins with the stronger legs had l more grey matter, had more white matter, and had less empty space in the skull, which wasn't filled with brain, the ventricles. So you can see here, this is a stronger twin of the twin pair. They're an identical twin pair. And you don't need to be a neuroscientist to see that the empty spaces, the ventricles here, are much smaller within the stronger twin than in with, within the weaker twin. So is this all because of cause and effect, or is there some other common pathway explaining this finding? Well, there's now a huge number, of, well, a growing literature anyway, of interventional studies, randomized control trials, kicked off by this man here, Art Kramer, from the University of Illinois showing that, uh, that aerobic exercise actually changes your brain and changes its function, both in normal older people, in younger people too, in people who have mild cognitive impairment, and studies are, undergoing, are underway now in people who have dementia. But we already know that physical exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, reduces your risk of dementia. Now, how does this happen? Well, aerobic exercise increases the numbers of connections in the brain, the synapses. It also does this through actions of nerve growth factors, which are hormones which um, make nerve cells grow. It increases levels of key neurotransmitters, the ways that nerve cells talk to each other, like acetylcholine and dopamine. And it increases the brain blood flow, giving the brain more resources to do its work. And there are also more systemic effects of exercise. For example, reducing the aging of the immune system and increasing the length of telomeres, the caps on the ends of the chromosomes, which are seen as the ticking clocks of the cell. But how much exercise do we really have to do? Well, we can all be really inspired by older athletes like this man and this woman. Did you know the oldest marathon runner is Fauja Fodja Singh, and he's 101 years old? And he's a vegan, by the way. Um, we can, I mean, older people can achieve amazing feats and really be an inspiration to us all. <laughs> but luckily, the good news is we don't all have to be marathon runners or pentathletes. No, the level of physical activity used in the interventions I spoke about, which change your brain, is within reach of the majority of people. It's just 45 minutes of walking, just three times a week and it can be built up gradually from just 10 minutes. And you don't have to wait until you're older either. Even studies in school children show that physical exercise increases your cognitive function. And remember, our twins, they were just different on everyday levels of physical activity, and none of them were athletes. The important thing is that you have to keep doing it. You can't store up all the effects from being a really good uh, super fit 20-year-old, and then a couch potato after that. Um, but if you are a couch potato, then all you need to do is stand up and get doing stuff. There are studies now showing that reducing your amount of sedentary time may itself be important. Now, a common problem is that um, people are worried that they might um, do some damage to themselves through exercise, and especially after a certain age, um, some enthusiastic um, first attempt leads to some pain which then puts somebody off. Um, well, the trick is to start gently. And um, the fact of the matter is that exercise improves chronic pain, both chronic pain in general and chronic pain from osteoarthritis. And it has really large-reaching other benefits as well. Benefits on your heart, benefits on diabetes, both reducing your risk of getting diabetes, but also if you have diabetes already, it helps your control. And physical exercise can also be um, important even in people who have stroke or cancer. Now, the real problem is how to embed exercise in daily life. Um, and this is a really open research question, actually. Um, and it's especially important because um, the interventions I spoke about do wear off if they're not sustained. Now, the fact is that most of us don't want to go to the gym. Uh, now, most of my patients have bus passes, but I tell them, get off the bus. Get off the tube one stop before you have to and walk the rest of the way. Park your car away from the supermarket so you have to walk in and carry your shopping back. Make it a rule to use the stairs as well as trying to find that special time for exercise. And 
a group, joining a group is often a good way to go. Well, here are my two boys um, uh, taking a dose of my medicine, um, braving the really cold, bitter March we've had um, just two weeks ago. And having a young family really um, focuses my mind on what ageing might be like for future generations. How can exercise compete with the DVD and the Game Boy? But it turns out that our mind needs physical space as well as virtual space to thrive. Up until now, each successive generation has aged better than the last one. But I wonder, are we really doing enough to make sure that this is still the case in the future? So just to summarise, I've told you that older people are really very varied, but it's not solely about your genes. And that of lifestyle factors, physical exercise is really the most important. And the choices we make every day may make a difference to how, whether we keep our marbles when we're 80. Thank you.